So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so, in this presentation, I will uh, briefly comment to you what we have done on, on the GEN network uh, on quality of service and um, where we are and possibly also what are the next steps. So I will briefly introduce you GEN if you haven't yet been introduced to it. Um, I will go briefly through the, the services available on GEN. Then I will go a bit more in depth into the premium IP service, then the less and best effort, and then provide you some picture about what are the queuing status on uh, the, the queuing on Jan and, and, and the status of it. And finally, I will finish by the next steps for the quality of service on Jan. So as you can see, um, oh, that's a mouse. It's not a pointer. Uh, Uh, the point. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this is the point. This is the this is the, the GEN network. As you can see, um, the, the, the speeds uh, are, var are very variable from 34 megabit per second up to 10 gigabit per second. So we have a very broad range of, of connectivity there. Um, so those are the, the country connected to the, the GEN network. And you can see also that countries are connected from 34 megabit per second up to 2.5 gigabit per second, and even now in Italy at 10 gigabit per second. Um, the service is on Giant. So you've, we've got, of course, the, the best effort IPv4 service. Uh, we've got also multicast IPv4, premium IP IPv4, less than best effort IPv4, and IP, IPv6 best effort this time. Um, what is the, the pre premium IP service? The premium IP service is a service aiming at, at providing to um, some, some upper bounded one way delay for the IP packet, upper bounded uh, IPDV jitter, uh, neg negligible packet loss, and a guaranteed capacity. The second IPQS service we've got on Gian is less than best effort, which is on the other way of the, of the scale, um, which is providing a lower service than the best effort one. So basically, the less than best effort packet will go through the router um, if there is some bandwi bandwidth left by the best effort and by the higher, pro higher class of service. So if we've got some congestion with just the best effort, the less than best effort doesn't go through. So what's the premium IP model? So Premium IP has been um, engineered by the Sequin Group, um, and which was whose aim was to provide an end-to-end -end quality of service um, across multiple domain and multiple technologies. So Premium IP can be provided with DiffServe, some ATM CBR PVC, or over potentially also over provisioning according to the, the status of, of the network. Um, the premium IP packets are tagged with the DSCP46, which is typically the expedited forwarding one. And you've got here the, the binary value for it. And the model has been engineered in such a way that it's a destination-aware service, which means that each network um, receives from its customer an aggregate and transmits this aggregate to another network. It's not... Um, so we are doing some, some rate limiting and, and uh, at the ingress of the network um, to avoid having peep. I will do a drawing here. It will be a bit better. So if this is my network, I've got three premium IP um, customers, which are all sending some traffic here. 
So if we don't do some um, rate limitation on the aggregate between one customer to another one, we could end up in the situation where all these customers are sending the IP premium traffic to, um, this, to, to this customer here, where here the, um, the bandwidth could not be big enough to cope with it. So we are rate limiting here on all, all the ingress uh, based on the destination of, of the packet to avoid this, this, this situation. Um, the other packets with other DSCP are left uh, unchanged and we, we, don't, we don't touch to the DSCP. And um, yeah, those, the other packets are considered as uh, best effort except if they are classified as less than best effort. And um, we have set a threshold of 10% of premium IP on any link on GND, knowing that in case of a link failure of, an e of a circuit of an equivalent capacity, the traffic could be rerouted on, 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 on another circuit and where we could, we could have uh, up to 20% of premium IP on, on this circuit. So this is how the model is working. So we are classifying the packet based on their DSCP, DSCP 46. Uh, we are doing it on all nodes and we are also um, mapping those packets to a high priority queue, either kind of strict priority queue or um, an emulation of a strict priority queue via the white drawn robin uh, in providing 90 or 99 percent of the band of the of the the, the weight or, or the bandwidth to to that queue. Um, we do not shape or police at the egress. The shaping here. So if the, if the packets are going from that direction to that direction, we are not policing the packet and we are not shaping there at the egress. We are only sh shaping the packet at the source. We don't want to uh, introduce too heavy uh, mechanism on, on the router. So on the first hop, on the first IP router, which is um, premium IP capable on the, on, on the path, um, the packets are classified and mapped to the premium IP class. Uh, we are policing them according to the SLA that the customer has uh, signed with the, its network provider, and we are marking it uh, as premium IP it, if it hasn't yet been done by the, by the customer itself. So on your domain, you, you have deploy, for example, diff serve. And then when, wha when you go from one, one domain to another one here, uh, this domain will, will not consider all the flows individually flow as from one IP address to another one. He will consider that he receive an aggregate from one customer here to another custo customer here. That's what I was explaining roughly here. So we are policing by based on the IS source and based on the, destina the destination IS. So we are considering only an aggregate here. So we are avoiding policing. Uh, you could have, um, if you trust enough what is done in, the ne in this network as policing, if you think the policing is well done and there is no risk, you could avoid the policing at the ingress of your of your network, but um, as a general rule, uh, we never trust the other people, so do it. So um, we are protecting um, the authorized prime IP traffic. So under normal circumstances, cir circumstances, uh, we are not expecting having more than ten percent of prime IP per or on each any circuit of our of our network, also on the on the access. But we know that we could go up to 20% in case of failure and rebooting of the traffic. So um, the first step we have done to implement uh, premium IP or, or on Giant was to bulletproof uh, Giant against the premium IP. I mean the unauthorized packet which are tagged as premium IP. 
So if you see jump like this, you've got various accesses, and by default we consider that uh, we we can't we didn't have any premium IP customer at that time. So any packet incoming and being tagged with the DSCP forty six was automatically retagged as best of all with the DSCP zero. So we are bullet proofing uh, the whole jam to avoid having some some kind of uh, nasty premium IP, uh, no, non authorized premium IP coming to perturb, perturb the authorized one. And then once we got some customer requesting premium IP, we set up here an access list allowing the source and the destination destination address address or, or prefix of 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 the connection requested. So you will. So let's say that you've got a customer here. Here, you know the IP address A B. So we are setting up the IP uh, a prefix list based on A and B and based on the DSCP forty six. But here you will tell me, oh, you you told us few few minutes ago that you were doing some rate limitation based on the IS. Uh, yeah, that's the model. But uh, currently, uh, this is not yet implemented on the router we've got. Uh, at least not on the, ver the OS version we've got. So we had to find a, another trick. And the trick was using the, the, the source and destination IP address. Uh, now we've got uh, Juniper has implemented for us a per next IS rate limitation feature that we can apply on our router here. So uh, possibly at uh, our next um, JunoS upgrade, we'll be able to implement it because the JunoS we are running, uh, the feature is not yet Im is not implemented on, on the JunoS version we are, we are currently running. So at that time, we would just have to specify a kind of entry, a kind of pipe, where we just specify um, coming from the NRN A, a here and going to the NRN B. So on the interface here, we will apply uh, next AS B, rate limitation um, X megabit per second, based on what the NRN has requested between A and B. And that's it. We will just have to modify this, and we won't have to, to, to play with the the IP address as we are doing now. Uh, whatever. You could do, it's based on the, the Juniper routing policy, so you can do based on communities, based on uh, uh, some, some uh, prefix list that you, you can establish, you can do it based on the next IS or any, any, any routing attribute. Um, yeah, so that was the bullet proofing of Giant. Yeah, and of course, um, any packet in, pro in profile here are w can go through with their DSCP46 premium IP tagging, and the packet out, out of profile are dropped in this case, which would mean that the, the source are sending more traffic that, that than what they have specified in their SLA. So how have we, have we configured the premium IP service on Giant? So I will mainly f um, focus, about, focus on, the, on the Juniper implementation. So Juniper has four queues per interface to, 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 to summarize. And we have dedicated the first one, first queue as being the best effort, the second one as being the premium IP, the third one as being the less than best effort, and the last one as being the network control where you got all your routing protocols. So to the best best effort, we allocate five percent of the bandwidth, and a Q priority being high. For the premium IP, we allocate ninety percent of the bandwidth, and a Q priority of being high. The less than best effort, we allocate zero percent of the bandwidth. And the network control will allocate 5% of the bandwidth. And the less than best effort will allocate a priority of flow. 
so here we here we know that through this premium IPQ we, only, we will only have between 10 and 20 percent of, of of the traffic of the whole interface going through because we have we are policing at the at on all the ingress of jams. So by doing so and by doing the path followed by the premium IP in our network, we know that we will never have more than 10, 20 percent of premium IP traffic into this queue. So this queue is largely over provisioned for, for the, tra the amount of traffic going there. Um, of course, we need to monitor this traffic. Um, so currently, we, we are monitoring the traffic based on the uh, DSCP value. So we have some graphs with uh, the aggregate value on the, on the, on the link. And um, we've got also a, a line for the premium IP and a line for the less than best effort. So we can see the utilization. Oh, I will show you I have a plot a bit further. Oops, that's that one. So the green the green line here is uh, the aggregate the aggregate traffic going through one interface, and the blue one corresponds to the less than best effort. So we can we can see the three the, the three different types of, of traffic at the same time. So. Um, but the, um, the, the, the premium IP is not only uh, monitoring the, the, the capacity and the bandwidth, it's also monitoring the delay and the jitter. Uh, we are currently in the process of setting up an infrastructure to, to measure the delay and the jitter on Giant and uh, possibly based also on those different services. So hopefully by uh, beginning of next year, we should be able to provide you some, some more information about um, the delays for the different type of service on, on Giant. Um, when you've got an end-to-end problem uh, for IP premium or for any other type of service, most of the time you don't know where, I mean as an end user, you don't know where the problem is. So we are trying to set up a PERT team, which is Performance Enhancement and Res Performance Enhancement Response Team, which would be a team that the end user would be able to call and tell them, oh, uh, look, I'm doing some video conferencing, it's not working. Uh, could you please help us to identify where is the problem? And within this per team, you would have network people who know how to troubleshoot the network problem, but also people knowing the application and uh, the hardware used by, in general. Because um, uh, the end-to-end -end performance problem does not lie either on the network or on the end host. You need a team of people being able to bridge all those um, all those knowledge to be able to really troubleshoot your end-to-end -end performance problem. So that's something we are working on, uh, I mean, that the TFNGN uh, working group is working on. So we have done also some, some testing. Um, not a, those tests were not, of course, jam only. Those were end-to-end -end tests between end sites within the NRMs. So they were sending some uh, variable bitrate uh, traffic between two inside, and you can see here that the jitter for premium IP is in this area, whilst the jitter for the for the best effort is much much more. The, the, the scope of the uh, jitter distribution is much broader. So in this case, premium IP provide you some kind of a better result for 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 the jitter, and here you can see the the jitter, the average jitter per packet size. In green, you've got the premium IP, and in red, you've got the best effort. And you can see that for all the packet size, the the, the jitter, the average jitter is much lower uh, for the premium IP than for the um, best effort. Uh, we didn't have any particular type of congestion during those tests. Uh, we had some. Uh, Various environment com which consists of ATM CDR PVC. Uh, we also got this serve on enabled on Giant on Giant during those tests, but also over provisioning in, in some of the network. So here it could have been 
premium IP could have been provided via uh, ATM CBR PVC. Oh, PVC. Here, um, so this is the, ca the case of, of, of GAR at that time when, when the tests were done. On Jan, it was diff serve. And on uh, DFN, it was over provisioning. So we were using different type of technique to provide this, this type of premium service. And we don't know exactly where those performance, th this difference of performance is coming from. Is it from the from one network or from another one? Uh, we haven't been able to um, look at look at it uh, in depth. So now at the other end of the scope of quality of service, we've got the less than best effort, which is by default a class of service which will use the bandwidth, which is not used at all by the other class, the higher class of services. So if you've got premium IP best effort and then less, less than best effort, the less than best effort will only use the resources ava available on, on, on one interface once the two other classes have, have been served. So we are using, um, it's considered a less than best effort packet, a packet which is stacked, which is stacked with the DSCP-8. Uh, we are reusing the same uh, DSCP than Internet 2 for the scavenger service here. Um, and if we've got on one interface some congestion due to the less than best effort, which means that, so this is, 0% of utilization of your interface, this is 100%. This is, for example, your premium IP. This is your best effort. If your less than best effort creates some congestion here, it should be fairly transparent to those two classes of service. The congestion created by the LBE should mainly impact less than best effort and not that much the best effort and the uh, premium IP. So um, the nice things with the best, less than best for service is that a, a, a service which doesn't have any end-to-end -end guarantee. So you don't have to, to play with complex um, SLA. Uh, you don't have to measure some metric. Um, so for an engineering point of view, it's, it's very nice to, to implement because it's, um, you implement it once and then you don't have to monitor it constantly. Of course, less than best effort doesn't mean crap. Uh, it's not because you are using a less than best effort service that even if when you've got no congestion of or on, on the network, you should, you should then con encounter some losses. So you've got less than best effort, but far below you, you've got a crap service. So we have to make the distinction in, here between the two of them. Um, a, a Another nice point of less than best effort is you don't need to support it everywhere. Um, you just need to support it on one interface where you've got some congestion. Whilst for premium IP, if you want to protect your premium IP, you need to start uh, bullet bullet proofing your all your ingress of your network. Here you don't need you don't need to. So you could wonder what the hell would I use such service? Um, so we have had some. Um, different thought from anyone of, of which use they could have of, of this less than best effort service. So for some of them, uh, they, could, they, they would like to use it for mirroring. So once they up update their, their, um, their server, they, they send some less than best effort traffic. So they don't have to send all the update during the night, maybe at, at midnight or one o'clock in the morning. They can do it continuously by using less than best effort knowing that if at one time they've got some uh, network uh, resource problem to reach their, their server, their less than best effort will be dropped and not the best effort used by th their user to, to retrieve the data. So you can also use the less than best effort for test traffic. So um, you may encounter some problem with, with, with the current version of TCP and you would like to modify the stack. Uh, but at the same time, uh, to, to make it a bit more aggressive, but at the same time, you don't want to disturb the, the existing uh, best, best effort traffic. 
So you could use uh, the less than best effort for doing your testing, where the impact on, on, the, on the best effort shouldn't be as, as big, uh, too, too, too big in, in uh, comparison of using uh, best effort for, for those tests. Um, so in a, in a university, you could protect the research traffic against the student dormitory traffic on your, on your access towards the TNRN, for example. So that's more kind of edge utilization of the less than best effort. So why could the network such as Giant want to use uh, less than best effort? So from time to time, there are some exhibition all over the world and people want to participate to some, um, uh, to break some record as shipping as much data as possible. Um, so by using less than best effort, they could try to push as many as much bandwidth as they would would like to uh, in, in the network without fearing of disturbing too much the best effort production traffic. Or some people want to ship large amount of data between between different different sites and they find that TCP is maybe not suitable for that and they, they would possibly like to use Tsunami, which is not really um, TCP, a, a type of TCP friendly protocol. So for that, you could use less than best effort and, and keeping the rest of the best effort traffic safe. So um, how, how do we implement it? So we allocate to the less than best effort queue a very uh, low weight. So this is my less than best effort queue and I configure a weight of zero person or one person according to how, how, you, feel, how, how you would feel it. Um, so you can see that in this case the less than best effort queue is no promise are done at all on the less than best effort queue. It's only if those two or if those three one uh, have used have emptied their queue that this one will start to be served, and that's also why we are using a low priority here to really have the less than best effort queue served after all the other. So we have done some. Uh, experiment with uh, the data grid project on Giant with uh, on this uh, less, less than best effort service. And you can see here um, we have plot the, the, the delay for the best effort here, here in red and the less than best effort in blue. Uh, we have, so we were congesting an, an STM16 interface and we were generating traffic with uh, with a, a smart bit and a SCM16 interface. So you can see that when we reach the, co the, the level, level of congestion here, that's the less than best effort which take most of the queuing ex additional queuing delay, whilst the, for the best effort, the increase is not as big. So for the, the best effort, in case of congestion here, we've got, we've got an increase of delay of 400 uh, micro microsecond, whilst for the less than best effort, we have an increase of 1.5 milliseconds here. So we can see that we can congest an interface with the less than best effort and not impacting too much the, the best effort. So another nice demo we've done during the European Research 2002 uh, exhibition in Brussels. This was in, in partnership with DataGrid and the VLBI, which is very large baseline interferometry. People, so th they've got some. Uh, um, what is it called? Huh? Yeah, they've got radio telescope all over Europe, and they would like to be able to ship the data they are collecting with their radio telescope through, uh, through to the through the networks rather than shipping da data via via the tapes as they do currently. So they want to evaluate if the network can cope with. Um, with their with the application, so they are still in the testing phase for, by now. So you can see here in green the the normal utilization of this STM16 link. With, so this is around 100 between 100 and 200 megabit per second, and you can also see the night and day shift of shift of traffic. So this peak here 
is when the radio astronomy people are pushing 500 megabit per second of data between Manchester and Amsterdam. So you see here the, the peak of the aggregate on, on the link. Then here, we are starting to send one more time with a smart bit with an SCM16 card. We are sending two gigabit per second of less than best effort traffic. So this is the blue line. And you see that it's really two gigabit. It's, it's two gigabit and it's constant. And then here, you've got the difference you've got here. So that's the 100 megabit or 150 megabits of traffic of production or of real production traffic. And then at this point here, the, the radio, radio astronomists are resending 500 megabit per second. And you, really, and you see that um, the less than best effort, we are still sending 2, giga, two gigabit per second of, less, of uh, less than best effort here. And you see that the less than best effort class is losing the bandwidth and allow the best effort to use all the bandwidth it's need. And you see that here, uh, we are it's flat. We are using the, the full bandwidth of the interface. So it's a nice, nice plot to show that uh, the protection of the best effort against the, against the less than best effort. So what's the status of the quality of service on Giant? So those three services, I mean best effort, less than best effort, and premium, <coughs> have been configured in most of the giant router. So those are the green one here. On the ye yellow router, we can see here, um, we, we have premium IP and best effort. We don't have less than best effort as it is because we are, those router have been reused from the prev previous network, 10155, and they don't have the enhanced uh, FPC. Those are Juniper M40, and they don't have the enhanced FPC. So if one, if once those, those those people want want to use less than best effort, they will have to tell us, and we will upgrade this um, this hardware according to to their requirement. And finally, we've got two router here, which which in red, which are two routers where we don't have premium IP and less than best effort. Those are also router which have been reused from the previous network, and then those are Cisco 7K routers, and the VIP which are on those who are not powerful enough to be able to support those two router. So here, once again, once Israel and Luxembourg, Luxembourg want to use those services, we will have to upgrade the hardware here. So a tool which has been very useful for us when we were configuring um, uh, the quality of service on GN and when we were debugging uh, some uh, problem between two different uh, boundaries is a simple trace cost, uh, trace route, sorry, but with, with a, a nice feature which have been uh, implemented by Simon Lyon from, from Switch. So once you, you set the TOS the TOS value in your trace route, you can see here in the output uh, an additional comment which tells you that the TOS has been rewritten to zero. So if you've got a classification problem or if you've got a re rewriting problem, you will be able to spot directly on your, on your path where the problem is. So you don't have to go on all the routers and check all the configura configuration uh, without being sure if it's the problem on this router or not. Here you can directly spot that the problem is in this router number four. That's not on the five. That's the five which detects then the, the, the router number four has changed something in, on the TOS value. So by doing this, we can directly go on, the, on this router here and find out that, find out that the classification hasn't been uh, applied properly. So this is, this is pretty handy. So what are the next steps for the quality of service on GMs? Um, currently, we have very few premium IP users. Um, there, there are possibly several reasons why we don't have that, that many premium IP users. The first one is possibly because if you want to provide quality of service on an end-to-end -end basis in, in, all, in all type of environment of the research network in, in Europe, you need at least to go via five different networks. So you have to contact five different entities to ask them, oh, uh, have you got this service? Uh, how can I uh, request it? How can I configure it? So it's it's a very long task, and 
uh, and then when, when, when the service is not available in the network, you have to try to do some lobbying and push the people to implement it. So I think this is, if, if, if those, those people are interested in. So the fact that you have to talk with five different people and sometimes do a bit of, of fighting with, with, with some people is one of the, of the main uh, reasons why, why Primo IP is not br broadly used. Another one is with the, the development of the, of the big backbone like the, the NRN and Giant, where you've got a lot of um, capacity available, people may wonder why, why would I need Primo IP where, where when I, I've got so much bandwidth. So this is, this is another reason uh, for why the, the premium IP is not, not so much used. Um, so in the next step um, for quality of service we, or on Giant, we would like to uh, try to solve one of those two issues, which is uh, to provide an easy way of people to request premium IP, at least on Giant. So we will create an interface where people can go and request some premium, uh, some premium IP. Uh, they, they would say, oh, I, want, I would like to request premium IP between this IP address and this IP address, uh, which correspond, in the case of Jan, from DNRN A to DNRN B. I want so many megabit per second between this date and, and, and that date. And we would let the, um, the APM, so the uh, access point manager, so that's the technical contact of each NRN, to access this interface and configure automatically, not configure automatically, but request very easily the premium IP on, on Giant. So here we can ease uh, the, the whole process of requesting premium IP end to end. Um, we're also working on the inter-domain monitoring activity where we would be able to exchange monitor data in each domain between those domains. So currently, um, you can have access to some information in this domain via either the looking glass or via some web tools available on, on the network, but possibly you don't have access to everything. What we would like to do is to build some kind of tool on top of each domain which allows to exchange the data and see for a given parameter the performance of these parameters across several domains. So let's say that you've got measurement box measuring the delay across all those networks and you would like to find out the delay between this point and that point. With this tool, we'll be able to check all the delay here at them and provide to the, to the user some information about the delay between that point and that point. And if he finds that the delay is too high between that point and that point, he would be able to zoom on a per domain basis or on an inter-domain basis and see where, where possibly the, the delay is too high. So of course that's not a tool really for network in our people. It would be more a tool first for the NOC and then for the, 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 the end user who knows a bit about how to understand um, the, the network parameters oops, and, and the information provided by, by such tool. But of course it would be nice if on the longer term, we, can, we could provide some um, very basic information about the end-to-end -end, uh, perf performance of, uh, of the network to, to, an end, to an end user. So he would have some trouble with some voice over IP or video, video conferencing. He could just run a, a small script which would tell, tell him, OK, the performances are, are fine, or no, the performances are not fine. Um, please contact your knock and provide him the trace that the tool has, has created so the knock can, can troubleshoot the, 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 the performances. So this is a, a big, the, the, the longer term ID behind this uh, inter-domain monitoring act, uh, activity. So this is um, uh, TFNGN uh, activity. And we've got also the, the PERT, which is Performance Enhancement Response Team, which would be a team to answer more specifically to end-to-end problem as network-wise, operating system-wise, hardware-wise, and also application-wise. So this is a long-term project. So the part would be very similar to, to the third, which, is, which exists now on, on, on security. So 
what about the, the, the QS implementation? Um, so what takes a bit of time is to find the correct parameters. Once you've got them, it's fairly easy. You just have to copy paste them everywhere on your network. Then you have also to bulletproof all your ingresses of your network. And once, once it's configured, it's pretty stable. You don't have to change too frequently some stuff. So, yeah. So you can find some more information about uh, the quality of service on the uh, on Giant on this on this URL where, where you can see um, which uh, DSCP value are used on Giant, how they are classified when when they are arriving on Giant, and and some other, some other information. So we would like to thank Parent for the loan of, the, of some smart bit for which allow us to do our testing and for Juniper for the technical support which allow us to configure uh, the quality of service on, on, on the Juniper routers. I'd like to ask you when uh, we as uh, the client of uh, NREN, so we, we can really get the benefit of the services, what will be the agreement between Giant and the NRM for providing that to the final user? So this is more of a NREN policy than, than Giant policy. Um, Okay, I can provide probably an answer for the Italian and um, When In the old times when we had not Giant but 1055, uh, there, there was a service based on ATM CBR circuits uh, granted almost for free to you projects or other users. If there are different kind of users, they may be a fair. This service in some way replaces this type of service used on ATM. Uh, in principle it is uh, available now but obviously depends strongly on the site where you from where you request the service as it was in the old ATM. And then there is an agreement between the Anerens and Giant to transport a certain amount of bandwidth. Obviously you can't require two gigabit of premium traffic. It's out of the specification, it's out of the, of the possibilities of the network. Um, we do provide already now in Italy some uh, small 2 meg, 8 meg circuits exactly for that purpose. So it is possible, but you have to contact each NRN separately, but not only the NRN in which you live in, but also the destination NRN, because it is a destination aware service. Is uh, round this uh, IPv6 ready now? Yes. Uh, are you going to uh, provide premium IP for this kind of protocol too? And this, sorry, and the second question, uh, I guess that now uh, the configuration of all those services, especially the premium IP, is done manually. Uh, are you thinking of uh, building or the implementing of a kind of tool or application for doing it uh, automatically? So the first question, um, basically the queuing mechanisms are exactly the same. Uh, so the, the question about IPv6 Prime IP is more when are the router equipment vendor ready to support IPv6 the classification of the IPv6 packet? Uh, I don't know if it's done, if it's, if it's already available or not. So, but it's just a, qu a question of having the operating system on the router supporting it. When it's done, for us, it's, it's not a big deal, I would say. Concerning the second one, so we are currently building a tool which allows the, the user to request some premium IP bandwidth. Um, so this tool can be extended, to con could be later on extended to configure automatically the routers. Now, we are still doing the configuration of, of premium IP during the maintenance window every morning between 6 and 8 to avoid disturbing too much the, the network. So if your question is related, um, can I request now some premium IP for the next two hours? The question is possibly not, not 
no. But if you want to request it now for the next the next week, one or two days next week, uh, you can do it. Now we still have to configure it manually. Any other question? Yes. Um, one of the things that we had fun discussing was the expectation that hosts shape. How how has that shaping worked out? Has it been okay, or has it not been tested too much? Or I right. to the bus tomorrow there. As far as I know, the main users were video conferencing systems, and there has been two experiments using InServe on the local environment and using the DiffServe extension, which is this model on the wide area network. Uh, both automatically rate limit, if you want, or shape the packet. Video conferencing never burst over 2 meg, the type they use. And obviously, if they wanted to test uh, InServe, automatically they shaped the packets according to the InServe policies. So the question is, yes on one way and no on the other. N no one never really checked a, a speed or capacity of 40 meg. Uh, a more in-depth comment maybe Sven could add to that. I know that Linux has good capabilities of shaping inside the kernel. It's not easy to configure, but it's there. So you can shape using uh, a Linux uh, software kernel. Uh, the other possibility would be just to use a simple interface. 10 meg, 100 meg is automatically shaping because the shaping is inside the computer. It's not done outside, and you do not do packets. And anyway, when we are configuring some, some policing at the ingress of Giant, we are giving an additional margin in such a way that if you are a bit bursty, uh, it still goes through, it's not drop dead at after 2 million per second. Any other question? Yes. Uh, also, the mode of the architecture we devised uh, actually skipped multicast. <laughs> That's thanks again, the speaker. Uh, this was the last presentation for this session. Good evening to everyone. <laughs>